Thank you for going. So uh, sorry for being uh, a little late. I'm going to reuse my 2083 slides and just update them when I talk. So if I say something that contradicts the slides, what I'm saying is correct. So, so I'm just going to give uh, some generic uh, GMO introduction, some technical information about GMO1, and then finally the, the actual project that, uh, that we started in the Osmocom group, uh, Osmocom GMO. Okay. So, uh, GMR stands for uh, Geomobile uh, Radio, and it's essentially, it's essentially uh, a standard for satellite phones that are uh, that's mostly used by Turaya, which is the, the most uh, known operator. It is heavily, heavily based on, on GSM, uh, so much that when you read the GMR specification, all the time you will find a reference to, okay, for this entire section, go see GSM. Section uh, 4.8 or uh, whatever. Uh, GMR itself is subdivided in several standards, GMR1 and GMR2. What we're going to be talking about today is uh, GMR1 specifically, because this is what's used in Turaya. Uh, GMR1 and GMR2 are not evolution of one another, so GMR2 is not the successor of GMR1 at all. They're just uh, concurrent standards that have been developed by different uh, sets of companies and they both have been standardized by the ETSI and so they have uh, kind of the same name uh, but some, some GMR1 uh, itself comes in, in several revisions GMR1, the, the plain old one which more or less corresponds to uh, GSM2G so essentially you know just plain old vo voice calls, SMS, uh, circuit switch data but um, no real you know, internet access or, or things like that yet. Uh, then they invented what they call the GMPRS, which is obviously the, the kind of equivalent of GPRS and GSM. And then they came with GMA1 3G. Um, 3G could, uh, you know, sounds a bit like the 3G on, GS on, uh, on, the, on the mobile side, but it's, uh, it's kind of different because uh, in the kind of uh, cell phone world, 3G is a completely different standard, so there is really nothing in common. It's a uh, WCDMA um, things like that. While uh, in GMA1, uh, GMA1 3G is really an evolution of GMA1, so it reuses a lot of the same stuff um, on the on the air interface at least. And GMA2, for example, is used in the in Marsat ISAT phone. Uh, if you want an example of use of usage, so yeah, this is essentially what I, what I just said. For Turaya, um, they have two satellites, Turaya 2 and Turaya 3. They kind of crashed Turaya 1 somehow. Um, and a good thing is it's, uh, it's visible from Europe, and actually here from Moscow you can see both satellites, uh, which is something I can't do uh, when I'm at home. So I'm kind of excited to see if I can actually see Jim the Turaya 3. It's really low on the horizon, so maybe it won't be possible, but yeah, maybe it will. You can go to some tall building. Yeah, uh, here, yeah. But usually, thought, I mean, you know, when you try to get in a tall building with a GMR antenna, a laptop, and a radio receiver, you know, it's <laughs> especially since that's something to know is uh, you really need to be outside to receive it, uh, even with an official phone, uh, because there is a lot of attenuation by windows. And I don't know if you have these here, but. Uh, um, all recent windows in, in, in Belgium, for example, are, are made to isolate the heat. Okay? And so what they do is they put a metal film, uh, a thin metal film in the window, which is a great air of shield. Uh, it attenuates the signal uh, really, really well, which is uh, not what we're looking for here. So this is the Turaya coverage map. So yeah, here in Moscow we're right in the middle. Uh, no problem. So a little uh, comparison with uh, with GSM. So as I said, it's very very similar, and all the terms that you know in uh, in GSM, we kind of add a G in front of them, and it gives the equivalent uh, element in, uh, in, uh, in GMR. So you know, BTS becomes GTS, VSC becomes GSC, VSS becomes GSS, uh, things like that. The MS is a little special, it becomes MS, MS for a uh, mobile earth station. Um, mobile space station. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I haven't done that yet. Although, the specification have a, have a whole section about, uh, 
uh, aeronautical um, stations, so like uh, fast moving planes and things like that, and then you have a mm -hmm. bunch of calculations for Doppler effect, and, you know, all this kind of stuff. Um, there are some things, uh, some features that don't exist in JSON at all. Um, the, actually, there are two features. Uh, what's called terminal to terminal call. So the the cell phone doesn't directly speak to, to another cell phone. What it does is it speak the one one of the Terraria handset speaks to the satellite and is directly connected to the other one without going through the the Earth station, the, the Earth station uh, of Terraria, which is in Dubai, and they do that to minimize delay and probably to save capacity as well. Um, For I, I don't know why, but uh, in um, V set, uh, this is called this is named mesh networking. When you talk to another uh, to another station without going to the air station, I don't know why it's called mesh. But they call it um, uh, yeah, in German it's called terminal, terminal call. And basically, when when you're in this mode, one of the one of the cell phones will behave exactly like the network. Uh, and the other uh, functionality is called uh, HPA for uh, high penetration highlighting. Uh, and that's basically, as I said, you can only see the satellite and, and have a real voice call when you're outside, which is um, not always practical. And so they have a, a very, very high gain channel. So this is a, a channel that doesn't transmit a lot of information, has a lot of form error correction, is transmitted with a high power of the satellite, and has high gain on the reception of the thing, basically everything. So that when you're inside, okay, you can't place any calls. But the satellite can still page you and tell you, okay, uh, someone is trying to call you, uh, you know, run outside so you can uh, receive receive the call. Um, it's it's very linked to, to GPS uh, as well. It's done both for technical reason and billing reason, because they will charge you more depending on which country you're in or if you're on the sea or things like that. Uh, and it's actually so tied in that the first thing the, your uh, your Toraya phone or your GMR1 phone does when you place a phone call is it will send your GPS position to the satellite in clear, which means that you know anyone in the area can know okay you're placing a phone call. And we'll come, we'll come back to, to that later. Uh, because it's so tightly linked, it also means that you don't want to pull out your phone and wait uh, you know ten uh, ten minutes uh, for a uh, for a cold GPS startup, so what they do is they broadcast the GPS uh, ephemeris and, and almanac, which are some some kind of data that allow um, a faster position fix. They broadcast that on uh, Toraya itself instead of having to wait for the GPS satellite to, to broadcast it. Uh, in practice, however, the Toraya phone that I have, I'm not sure if it actually uses that because it takes forever to to get the GPS up. Compared to GSM, they use a new speech codec, which is uh, done by a company named DVSI uh, Incorporated, which is a company that only do only do voice codecs. And AMDA is not is not a codec itself; it's more like a family of codec. They have a whole range of, of different uh, codec that use that kind of uh, technology. Um, we'll come back to that later. And finally, they use a, a new cipher. So, uh, we can play stack by stack. Uh, to GSM, layer 0 and layer 1 are completely different, mostly because the, the type of medium is completely different. You know, your, your average phone, uh, cell phone, has to talk to a base station which is you know, a few kilometers away at worst, um, while on the other hand, the, the Terraria handset has to talk to a geosynchronous satellite um, which is like 36,000 kilometers away. Uh, so, obviously, there's a, a lot of issues with delays. And things like that, so they, they use completely different layer one and uh, layer zero, there's just no comparison. Layer two, it becomes already a lot more similar because LAPSAT and LAPDM, which is the layer two of, uh, so LAPSAT is the layer two of GEMA one, obviously, and LAPDM is the layer two of um, GSM. They're both, ver they're both simplified version of LAPD, which is a, a ESDN protocol. The only thing they did is they Again, they, they, they have to compensate for the delay, so basically they don't. They have to uh, have a, a much uh, larger acknowledgement window because when you send a message, uh, the time for the message to go from your phone to the satellite 
to the earth station and then the acknowledgement to go from the earth station to the satellite to you, it's like, I mean, it takes like 250 milliseconds per leg of the transfer, so it's four legs, so there's at least one second of delay just of, of transfer time uh, over the air, uh, which is something that uh, LAPDM can't deal with. So they, they increase the wind the size of that, and they try to save, uh, to save as much uh, space as possible, so they use shorter rudders and, and tricks like that to really minimize the data in traffic. Layer 3, well, so layer 3 is, is, div is subdivided in three sub -layer. The first sub -layer is called Radio Resource Management, RR. And, um, hi Travis. Hi. <laughs> uh, and so radio resources, again, pretty different, mostly because, well, it's called radio resources. So, and since the radio is completely different, radio resources is kind of different. Uh, that, that kind of makes sense. From there, everything else is common. I mean, MM, uh, which is mobility management and call management, basically all the higher level control, uh, things like that. Everything is exactly common. When you look at the GMS spec, it's going to say, please see GSM uh, section 4.8. Chapter one. Uh, for all of that was for kind of for voice. For packet data, the simulation is, is similar. So what's called RLC and, and MAC is kind of equivalent to the RR in, in voice call. And this is different because this manages the radio resources for packet data. This is radio resources, and since the radio is different, again, it's different. And everything from LLC and above is. Um, well, it's exactly a GPRS, uh, the GPRS model, and they actually can. I think I have that on, uh, here on this side. Uh, so everything which is uh, you know kind of colored is uh, is something that's specific to to GMR, and uh, everything that's uh, white is, is common, and everything uh, from here. This is actually a GSM core network, so they buy GSM equipment made for GSM, uh, which means if, you, if I take my SIM card and put it in a Duraya phone, it will actually work and roam on Duraya exactly the way it runs on any other operator, because um, for anything that's higher level than just the actual radio link, it's completely common. Yeah, and to charge you also the same roaming charges as it's roaming Yeah, charges. probably <laughs> higher. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's like 10 euro per minute or something. So you don't, you don't really want to call unless you're really, really in trouble. Um, so the way it works is really out of money. <laughs> <laughs> if you're out of money, you really don't want to spend 10 euros for a phone call. Uh, so you have the satellite, obviously. And as I said, it uses L band for, for its traffic, which is around 1.5 gigahertz in the case of Turaya. And they use technology called SpotBeam. That is, they use uh, beam forming beam forming algorithms um, to create a um, kind of artificial zone of coverage that uses different frequency and uh, that kind of corresponds to the uh, to the GSM cells. Um, one big difference, though, is that those area are pretty big. You know, just like uh, oh my, oh my, yeah. I think one area pretty much covers uh, the entire Belgium. There is like two or three, um, I, know, I think it's just one area for, for Germany as well. So, you know, yeah, kind of big. It kind of depends on, on where you are on the Earth, because um, the inclination of the beam, depending on the Earth's source, you know, if the satellite is here and the surface is inclined, the, the beam tends to be a little elongated. Um, I th I think and they also de make them denser where they have a lot of traffic. Uh, I think that there is a map of, of beams somewhere. Yeah, yeah, I, I have one, uh, uh, I have one here, actually, I can, uh, find, uh, oh wait, no, I don't have it in, no, sorry, I don't have it here, it's on my other one drive. Uh, so, yeah, as I said, um, L band, it uses left intercular polarization, which is important for the antenna we built, and I actually uh, wrapped my first helix in the wrong way. Um, these are the frequencies that are used. Like in GSM, they use different bands of frequency for uplink and downlink for information from satellite or to the satellite. 
And like in JSM again, they did the they divided in what's what's called RFKin. Uh, I think there's a uh, like one thousand of them. Something like that. <coughs> Something that's also interesting uh, to notice is, is the feeder link, uh, because when I originally uh, made this presentation, we didn't have a lot of information on the feeder link. Um, however, that has changed because one very nice guy in Saint Petersburg uh, has access to some very nice dish of like six meters in diameter, and he sent us. Uh, captures of, of what's on the air on the C-band. And so if, if you look at the diagram, essentially every call of every uh, cell goes through the feeder link, through the feeder link, which means if you can listen to the feeder link, you get, you get, you get everything, which is you know, very cool. Um, there is one feeder link per satellite, so, you, so you'd need two, um, but you know, one satellite and it covers a very, very big part of, uh, of the world already. And so to patient theater, you need to be near the uh, near the air station, yeah? Uh, Not really. How the, near? Uh, well, I mean, the the, the air station is in Dubai, and the guy who did the capture is, is there in there Petersburg. One air station, yeah, yeah uh, there is two. There is one in Dubai, and there is one. We're not really sure where the other one is. It's either in the UK or maybe in the. Um, in Egypt, it's not very clear. It's not like they publish a very detailed specification of where they put the air station, but we know for sure that one is in Dubai. Uh, I think it just depends on the diameter of your dish. If you had good enough dish, yes. <laughs> it, it also apparently depends on the weather in Dubai because, uh, or at where the air station is, uh, because what they do is to save power on the satellite. If the, the earth station can receive the signal strongly, they will tell the satellite to diminish the transmit oh. power. And if there is interference, they will either satellite to raise the transmit power, things like that. So it kind of uh, varies with the, with the time. So we didn't know exactly what was that feeder. However, when we looked at the captures, it became like very, very apparent that uh, the satellite they just bounced the signal. It, what you find on the feeder is it, exactly what you find there. Uh, I mean, you, it's not divided in 1087 frequency, but, but you find the exact same uh, 31.250 kilohertz uh, channels, and you can, you can demonstrate them, they're exactly the same. The primary difference, in, in that kind of make a, makes it a little bit harder, is that when you listen to L band, you have, uh, you have the synchronization information, because it's provided by the satellite to the phones. Okay, so you can easily synchronize to the bursts. When you listen to C-band, you don't have those information. We kind of assume that uh, the, the satellite synchronizes itself to the Earth station, uh, but yeah, we're not the Earth station, so so we have kind of uh, to align manually. But, you know, we'll, we'll say, uh, what we do basically is we just brute force the alignment. Once you get a burst at the moment, it's, uh, you know you get the, the right alignment. So uh, okay. This is the physical layer of uh, Uriah. It looks pretty much like GSM, except they changed all the numbers. Uh, that means one frame is not you know, 8 times, but it's 24 times not. Um, one multi-frame is not 51, uh, it's not 51 frames, it's like 24, uh, or 16, sorry. Uh, and then they grouped it in, in like super frames. I really don't know why super frames are used because they describe it in the standard and then they never use it. <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know what it's supposed to be. Uh, the symbol rate is pretty low. It's uh, 23.4 kilo, kilohertz. And, um, you know, burst, that is the, the unit of information that's transmitted on, on that physical channel, will occupy several consecutive time slots depending on on what that uh, that burst um, is, you know, how much information it has to carry. So it has kind of a variable length. But it's not variable per, per packet. It's variable by channel time. Um, something else is that this is for voice. Okay, when you move to internet access, they wanted more uh, bitrate because they can, you know, uh, provide more capacity for for internet access. And so they use uh, multiple of the simple rates. So you, instead of using 23.4, they're going to use like 23.4 multiplied by 2, or multiplied by 3, or multiplied by 5. Uh, and that makes the channel that much, uh, that much larger. 
So this, this is the synchronization uh, information uh, that I was talking about. Uh, yeah, sorry. Um, so when you look at it on the you know, waterfall display, you really can't miss it because it's like a big X. Uh, Human readable synchronization. Yes, exactly. <laughs> it's, it's really nice. Uh, it's really easy to find. So there is a mathematical process that you, that you can use to synchronize to, to this waveform. And I, I find the, the process pretty neat because um, if you're sufficiently close in frequency and in time, uh, just by doing a couple of FFTs, you're going to be able to uh, find the time and, uh, and frequency alignment, um, which is a really elegant solution compared to the one in GSM, which is uh, more brute force. Um, and also one big uh, difference compared to GSM is that they don't transmit all the time. If you, if you look at a GSM client, there's going to be power there all the time. Uh, so the phone can easily find them. On the satellite, they don't do that because you know power is is uh, is really important. Satellite, you you're trying to to save it as much as possible. And so that that synchronization pattern is not transmitted as often. And if the if the satellite doesn't have anything to say, it's not gonna say anything. Um. Yeah, and, and the more math and the more interesting things about this uh, synchronization, I think, I think the history of the synchronization is that in uh, this at, at that link, right? Sorry? Uh, there, uh, there's a paper about this synchronization. Yes, yes, there's a paper that describes it. Uh, it's the link there. Uh, the, the more information link, it gives the link to, to a paper that describes exactly how that waveform works. Um, it's mm -hmm. called the dual chip, and so basically you have two single tones that uh, vary in frequency and cross themselves in the, in the time problem. Yeah, so for those who are interested, just follow the link. Yeah. You can also read the source code of Osman GMR, there is the Kind of step by step synchronization. It's really, yeah. You know, at first, I didn't really know how to synchronize to that, and then uh, you know, a little googling, so you find the paper and say, oh my god, this is really easy. Um, okay, these are the modulation that I use in EGMR. Uh, so it's called Pi 4 CQPSK. Uh, the Pi 4 basically means that after each symbol, um, the the constellation is rotated by pi over, uh, pi over 4 and QPSK, QPSK sorry, means um, quadrature phase shift keying so basically you have four symbol so four possible phase um, alignment and CBPSK is basically the same thing as this except you only use uh, uh, this one and this one and this one and this one so it's kind of a special case um, it's used for some channel types where you want to be more resilient to error because obviously if, if you have only two possible phases you, you, when you're making a decision uh, you have less chance of being wrong uh, there is a lot of different burst type in GMR there's a lot of different possible motivation and when you move on to uh, special features like uh, you know, high penetration analytics as I, as I mentioned the earlier and when you move to 3G uh, you can get constellation like this, where you have a lot more symbols, you can transmit a lot more info information, but it becomes a lot more complex to actually get the data like this. And, uh, by the way, we don't support uh, this, this, or this uh, yet in, in our small GMR. This is something that we uh, still must, uh, must add. We support this one. Anyone wants to write the elevator? This is a layer one channel coding. So once you once you know how to map the bits on the on the burst, you can get the bits, and then you have a very long chain that's going to use uh, a bunch of, of different elements. What's important to know is it depends heavily on the on the burst type uh, again. But it always uses the same kind of uh, kind of thing. So you have like CRC, you have convolutional code, you have uh, a scrambling, you have uh, interleaving, uh, things like that. And again, uh, like in GSM, you have the encryption, which is very low on the stack, which means encryption is again done in, in layer one. Um, so all the error, all the um, error correction is done, and then they apply ciphering. Um, and this is a bad idea most of the time.
well, yeah, pretty much all of them. So yeah, LAP sets is already too, it's pretty boring. Uh, I mean, what it does is it segments the higher level messages into fixed size messages. It handles things like retransmission, contention resolution, um, SAPI, which is a kind of multiple sub-channel within the, the primary communication channels. Uh, yeah, I'm not really interested in V2. And then layer 3, you're basically fine, what GSM has. As I said, LRR is different, uh, but you're going to find the same messages. So, uh, you know, you have a message that's called immediate assignment in GSM that um, tells the phone to go onto a different channel. You're going to find a, a message named immediate assignment in GMR. It just coded differently, but it, it's there and it does the exact same thing. It just, you know, has different bits inside. Okay, the, the speech codec is, is kind of a big remaining problem. Um, as I said, it's, it's made by a company, oh yeah, it's, it's proprietary, which means when I first started GMR, I kind of assumed that it was like Tetra or GSM, is that a TSI published a reference implementation we could use. I was wrong, uh, because they don't. Um, it's, it's really closed. Pretty much, we know, you know, it's, it's derived from uh, advanced implement excitation, uh, so we kind of know all the operates. There's a bunch of patterns made by, by this company, or if it was not, there's not one pattern that matched to the exact codec made for GMR. They have a bunch of, of patterns that cover different bits and pieces, and we don't even really know which one are applicable to GMR or which are not. Because, for example, for, te for uh, Tetra, okay, there is also um, two codecs that are used that I named uh, EMBE, which is improved multiband excitation, which kind of comes just before advanced multiband excitation. Uh, and they also use a kind of a derivative, derivative of uh, advanced multiband station for for more recent version of, uh, of Tetra. But again, uh, in, tet in, uh, in Tetra, there is specification, in, in, so you can take the specification and implement it for GMR, there is no such thing. Uh, one thing we kind of hope is that DVA sites publish, um, sorry, sell this kind of uh, USB stick that contains an hardware decoder that you can plug into your PC and we kind of hope that it would support this variant however we contacted DVSI and said that uh, no, it supports the Tetra variant, it supports another variant but it does not support the exact variant uh, used by GMR and the, the cheapest thing you can buy to decode this connect is like a, a $2,000 uh, network appliance made for voice transcoding made by, by this company um, and you have to special order it because they, they have to load the special firmware for, for GMR. And since I don't have 2,000 dollars to you know, spend into a decoder, it's currently not implemented. What we kind of hope is to, uh, to find it in the phone DSP. We know the voice codec is there, okay? because uh, when we look at the PCB, there is just nowhere else it could be. Uh, so, so it's in there. We have an extracted um, ROM image of the DSP. Fortunately, it's kind of big. It's written in uh, yet another DSP assembly. It's supported by EDA, so you know that's a start. Uh, but it's big, and you know, locating some feature in a in a DSP are are easy. Uh, locating some other stuff is, is pretty hard. So, for example, locating a cipher algorithm in a DSP is pretty easy because what you have to do is you look for XOR instructions. Okay. And you know about that the second hit, you're gonna find the after cycle for the for for the voice codec. Uh, mostly because I have no experience in voice codec, so you know even if I was staring at one, I wouldn't know that it's one because I have no idea what the voice codec looks like. Uh, Do you have a dump? Yes. Okay. You want one? I'd love one. Ah, you get it. <laughs> <laughs> so from the speaking I knew that would be a good fit for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there is some good and there is some bad. Um, and and this, this is going to be a, this is going to have to be to be updated. Uh, we can go at the next slide. What it is exactly? Okay. So the, the good thing is, in GSM, one of the way we have to to break the the algorithm is that. Um, GSM sometimes sends completely predictable frames, okay, 
and they're sent because even when you're uh, when you're on a control channel, if you have nothing to say, you send a uh, say uh, frame that basically says I have nothing to say, uh, which is always the same content over and over again, which provided plenty of playtext. So in in uh, in Gemini you don't have that because they're trying to save power both on the on the unset side and on the on the satellite side. Uh, something else that, that's pretty good is that LAP SAP, which is the layer two, um, it handles contention resolution. That is, when two phones try to speak at the same time, uh, the satellite has to have some way to tell uh, which of the phone um, has priority. Okay, and the way it's done in GSM is that. The first message that the handset uh, sends is going to be repeated back, um, and then if the handset sees, okay, that's not my message, that means that's not my channel, it shouldn't be here, it just goes away. Um, the way it works for the set, it's, it's not the same thing, it just sends back a, a hash of the content rather than the content itself. And that's important for security because the first message that's sent always contains some form of identity of the phone. So it contains either the IMZ, which is the subscriber uh, identity that's on the SIM, or a tempor uh, temporary identity. And what this allowed us to do in GSM is that we always listen for that first message, and this way we know uh, which channel belong to which phones uh, without having to listen to the uplink of the phone. So we don't have to be near the phone, we just have to be near the base station, and we know each channel to which phone belongs, and that allows you targeted attacks. Uh, you can't do that here. Um, because it's, it's not even back. Um, again, so bad. It's optional. On Terraria, it's used all the time. Uh, so, but the, the specification doesn't, doesn't really force it. But yeah, on Terraria, it's, it's used definitely. Um, some of the attacks of of, G, of, um, of GSM just are applicable exactly the same to GMR. Just because GMR essentially copies GSM in ninety percent of the way. So some. Uh, Fundamental attacks like the MZ Detach, uh, which, is, which is a denial of service that allows to cut off service to some subscribers because some message are not authenticated. Um, and the RSH denial of service attack, which is an attack where you send a bunch, uh, you send a bunch of access requests, and the satellite is going to assign you a bunch of channels. And before you realize that those channels uh, are not really used, you can actually uh, use up all the available channels, except. On GSM, you take out service you know, on a, a single base station. Here, you take out the service on the entire spot, which pretty much covers like countries and things like that. So we didn't really test it, you know. <laughs> we just, you know, send a couple of them and see. Okay, it allocated us two channels. We're not gonna send a hundred or a thousand of them because we don't want to get in trouble. But uh, there's no theoretical reason why it wouldn't work. You know, the specifications are pretty much the same. And some of the really, really bad news is the RSCH request, the, the first message that's transmitted by your phone when you do um, when you place a phone call or do anything, uh, it contains a lot of information clear. Among which is the, as I said, the GPS position, your GPS position, and um, the reason for the channel request, which if you're placing a phone call, it's gonna actually contain the phone calls that you're dialing. Um, so, as I said previously, it's possible to listen to the, the C-band feeder link. So you can get all those RSH requests for you know, an entire satellite. And so you can map all the phone calls that are currently going on and, uh, and things like that. Or you can listen to the uplink of the phones. And this is really bad because um, there was some concern some, some time ago um, about like, uh, you know, journalists and things like that that were using satellite phones um, in uh, Syria. Yeah, in war areas. Yes, exactly, in, in, in war areas, and uh, if, uh, if you know, the other side has access to, to that kind of equipment, and we know, we actually know they do, uh, they have some, some Terraria interception equipment, they, they can just get your GPS position and, you know, send artillery or whatever, and you really don't want that. Yeah, so um, that, 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 that happened, so the discussions was yeah. After uh, some journalist was covered by an ar ar artillery, when he tried to use his uh, his uh, satellite phone. Yeah. And so, but but basically, uh, David Burgess, uh, the author of Open BTS, uh, like correctly noticed that uh, you, you you even don't need 
to be able yes. to intercept Raya just because if someone is using a satellite phone uh, this is already a red flag because not that many people use it like satellite phones and so it's pretty easy to 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 spot it just using the rudder or like things like that so uh, I mean you don't need to actually intercept anything if you know that this is a war zone and somebody is using a satellite phone and this is not uh, your your guys this is the opposite guy, so it's better to like kill them. <laughs> yeah, but you can as soon as you have uh, some air power on L band that is being transmitted from the ground, you can be pretty sure there's a satellite phone there. So you can use triangulation to, to find it. Just send the rocket there. Interest. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but we say it and sorry, you know. <laughs> um, so yeah, and as I said the cipher is still uh, applied at day one. So um, this slide is completely updated. Uh, because the cipher is known, uh, there's a group of German researchers uh, which in November, if I remember correctly, they extracted the DSP ROM, okay, and um, they sent me a copy and they, they worked on, on, on themselves and eventually the, the cipher was, uh, was extracted and the, once you get the DSP firmware out of the phone, or in, the, in their case it was out of the firmware of the file, uh, it's free available on the internet. You just look for XOR and then you find a cipher. And we knew we knew some things. <laughs> we knew it was derived from A52. It's not exactly A52, but it's very, very, very similar. Um, so much similar actually that some attacks can, can be applied. Um, and speaking of attack, so those are German guys that developed an attack that works on, on uh, speech channels. However, this attack kind of takes a long time. It takes around 30 minutes, uh, if I remember correctly, and a decent sized machine to, to recover the key. Uh, but since then, we actually took one of the available attack from uh, A52, one of the state-of-the-art attack on, on A52, which adapted it to GMR, and it works perfectly, uh, which means we can actually break the encryption in uh, 500 milliseconds or something like that, and uh, without knowing any plain text. Um, if you know plain text, uh, that can actually go about twice faster and use a little less memory. So, you know, there's literally no security there. So it basically means there is no encryption. Yeah. I mean, um, in a receiver I, I was testing, um, it was actually easier to just implement the breaking of all the channel that allow you to, to enter a given key on the command line, you know. It's, uh, yeah. As I said, the availability of plaintiffs might be limited. Um, that's not completely true. Well, what's there is true, you know. The, the TCH3, you're not going to find any plaintiffs on them. There is um, no SSCH. So those two, the SSCH and the MTLAP, uh, LAPDM frames and JSON, were two big sources of known plaintiffs on JSON. We don't have those on, on Pariah. But it turns out we have something else. Um, with, as I said, the delay is, is pretty significant from the handset to the earth station, which means that when ciphering is turned down, before any other message can be transmitted, it has to be acknowledged. And the, the three first frames that you're going to receive just after ciphering has been turned down, they're actually just acknowledgement from the three previous frames uh, that it took to send the, the ciphering command. And so those three uh, are just acknowledgement, which means that their content is almost 100% known. The only unknown is the acknowledgement number, and you don't even have to guess it. You just take the, the previous frame, which was inside of acknowledgement number, you do plus one, plus two, plus three, get the number, you, can, you, you know the entirety of the frame. So, yeah, I mean, uh, the, that's, uh, that was one of the, the main updates uh, compared to this. Um, yeah, and they sell commercial, uh, you know, interception equipment. L3 Communication uh, kind of manufactures it and it's redistributed to, di to different vendors to uh, supposedly good government agency, but you know, the government of Sanya uh, got hold of one of so this and so they could get it uh, um, some other way. It's pretty expensive though, and if you ask them directly, they're not going to talk to you, but it exists. 
So uh, this random GMR project itself started in uh, in mid July when um, our web just read the spec, but she didn't have any time to to do any any work itself. Um, late July, uh, Horizon, so uh, Dimitri uh, Stolnikov, yes, uh, made some captures and uh, posted the result and, and displayed the, the FFT. And on it, you could see this clear X pattern, so we knew we were receiving a, a Theraya. Um, at the time, I was busy with, with other stuff, and nobody really looked into it um, until CCC camp. You know, uh, we got together and we worked a little bit on, on uh, improving signal reception because at the time he was using a satellite dish with uh, uh, also an helical feed and a, pre and a filter and a pre-amplifier so it was kind of a complicated setup to, to replicate so that, that wasn't very practical and just after CC camp I just went home um, and I tried to build myself uh, one of those helical antenna and the, f the first one I made was pretty crappy, but it worked, you know. So, so okay, it, I knew it was possible to yes, receive. So here is the here is their first setup, like the photos of, I think. The yeah, that we but I, I have pictures of it uh, later on, I think. Uh, yeah, I have pictures later on of the various receivers there. Yeah. So I'll just show them at, at the time. So, what we wrote is um, the capture utility, which. Essentially, what it does is it takes it takes RF input from whatever device you have, and transform it into um, IQ stream. Send. Okay. Originally, and, and the way it still works in the main branch is you use a C file intermediary, or you can use a FIFO, and things like that. There is an experimental branch that um, does live streaming. I'll try to sh show that uh, later if you try to, to receive some signals. Um, then you send it to the actual uh, main main process um, of also GMR, which is GMR one Rex, and this will do uh, all the you know demodulation, synchronization, all that kind of stuff, and finally forward the packet to uh, channel decoding, which will take the burst we construct after uh, play two packets, and finally send it to Wireshark, where we can have a nice display of uh, decoded data. Um, wait, I think I'm sorry sorry for this. Okay, so the reception that's that's the setup that uh, uh, Dimitri was using. So it's a it's an offset dish with a helical feed, and then here you have a, a small. Uh, that's actually the preamplifier. So that's a preamplifier. Then you have you don't see it on the picture, but uh, near his USB he has a L band filter extracted from the phone. So pretty complex setup. Uh, um, this is uh, my second helical antenna, which is much much better than the, than the first one, but still pretty easy to build. And this is a, a biquad antenna made by Steve, uh, yeah, biquad, um, which is also fairly easy to make because all you have to do is edge PCB with the right pattern and put it over some ground plane uh, with the right distance, you just use aluminum foil and, uh, and you get an antenna that works very well. Unfortunately, he, he hasn't published the dimensions for his bike quite yet, he, he still must do that. Uh, I need to ping him about that. Um, optionally, you can, you can use... Um, so, okay. The idea is, is you don't need all all the all your elements in your chains to be perfect, you know. Uh, but you have if you have all of the worst case ones, that, that just might not work. But for example, if you have a good antenna, you might not need a preamplifier, uh, or if you have a uh, uh, a good USB uh, a good reception card, you might not need a preamplifier either. But if you try to use, for example, uh, a very cheap USB, USB stick with a, a badly made decal without filters and stuff like that. Yeah, that might not work. So, yeah. um, these are options for the LNA. You can either buy one. Uh, this one is made by um, a John guy, uh, um, radio matter, um, called EGU0VA. Uh, that makes a, a LNA for this. And the other option is, and this is what I uh, attempted to make, and it will hopefully test later on. Uh, 
is to repurpose um, a LNA from from a GPS antenna. And something I, I, I forgot to mention uh, uh, when I was talking, when I was building it, is that when you do this, you need to provide power to to this. So that's why we have a kind of two wires sticking out. Uh, is that usually when you use it, the G, GPS antenna with a GPS receiver, the GPS receiver is going to inject like 5 volts or 3.3 volt DC onto the RF line, which is something that most of, uh, of the receiver, like the FunQ dongle, the RTLSDR, or the USB, can't do um, natively. So we just add a power wire to it to feed power externally. The receiver. Uh, that's actually much more often than that. So you have the, you know, any two server will work, uh, provided you get the, the reception card. And this is a very good option, but it's very expensive. Um, the fan cube dongle is, sorry, kind of was now a good option. Uh, what's good about it is that it's relatively cheap, uh, but it's pretty good sensitivity. And fortunately, it's this very small bandwidth. It only has 96 kilohertz of bandwidth, which means you can barely fit three channels there. And three is even pushing it. Two is, is much better. Um, so there's, yeah, Osmo SDR that almost exists. Uh, it's going to be released, hopefully soon. And one of the cheaper options, and this is the one we're going to try today, is to use the RTL SDR. So if you haven't heard of, uh, of what it is, it's uh, kind of these USB sticks, and these are made to receive DVB TV. Okay, so they're, they're like TV sticks, but the the chip that's inside has kind of a debug mode that allows to retrieve the raw IQ samples uh, from the stick, and so this can actually be used as a sort of defined radio. It's uh, it's both good and bad. I it's think it's not a debug mode. It's used. Uh, in like uh, for yeah, it's used for FM, but originally yeah. it's yeah. But if you look at the first sheet, it doesn't exist officially. Okay. You know, they kind of used it for FM, and and uh, we're pretty sure that it is was kind of a debug mode because it's right next in the same setup register. You can uh, retrieve a cons uh, consecutive number like one, two, three, four, five, six, just mm -hmm. to test USB members. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, we kind of think that FM was kind of an afterthought. Uh, yes. They realized, oh wow. It, it actually works and we can use it for that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> so, yes, so, so commercial sticks use this to receive, uh, the stick itself receives DVB and demodulates it uh, uh, in hardware, yeah. but they also use this mode to be able to receive the FM, AM, or like other things like that in software. So if you buy the stick, you have a software on a CD which allows you to receive uh, radio, like DAB for example. They do this with this IQ debug mode. Yeah, with exactly. small bandwidth. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, there are some bigger. These are the smaller ones. There are some bigger ones. Uh, it kind of depends on uh, where or uh, how you bind it. Uh, so what's good is that they have a they have a relatively uh, large bandwidth. You can pretty much reliably pull two mega samples per second out of them, which is you know less than a USB can do. But it's definitely a lot more than the fun cube can do, for example. Yeah, and it's small. Yeah, and uh, it doesn't require external power. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The only downside is it the, the dynamic range is pretty limited because it's only eight bits. Um, so that's that's not very good, and also there is some gain control that we don't entirely understand yet because even though we were speaking with Realtek, uh, Realtek is the manufacturer of the chip inside. Um, you know, they can't even tell us, uh, at least the people we talk to, uh, they, they send us a data sheet, it's not complete. Uh, so we don't know exactly how everything works. But for, for GMR, it's not too much of a problem because since all the signals you're receiving are coming from the satellite, the same satellite, they pretty much all come at the same strength. So dynamic range is not too much of an issue. And the gain control, yeah, well, it works sufficiently good um, for, for GMR purposes. So, not much of a problem. 
So yeah, reception, uh, we have a really easy uh, software for this. Unfortunately, I'm not sure if it supports this uh, this stick yet, actually. Uh, if it doesn't, I have to ask Horizon to support it. Uh, like you, you can do do it manually, but if you have one of those three hardware, which uh, which is not to be supported by the tool, all you really have to do is tell him to which RFK you want to, to listen to, and it will just configure everything for you. Sample rate, filters, and we just output to the two C files uh, containing compact sample that you can just feed to the um, to the next step in the process, which is uh, which is Osmo GMR. Uh, yeah. When writing Osmo GMR, by the way, we kind of realized that we didn't have any. We wanted to do some uh, some signal processing, and we we wanted uh, to be able to reuse this in several projects. So we created a library, which, by the way, has now been renamed to Libosmo DSP rather than Libosmo SDR because Libosmo SDR was conflicting with the Osmo SDR hardware project. So we renamed it, um, and it just contains a bunch of uh, signal processing utility that that we want to reuse for several projects. And uh, I mean, there is a new radio that's done for that. When you have to build new radio in its entirety and then link to C++, and then you have to use their framework if you want to use the filters and things like that. And it also doesn't work very well when you have uh, packets of data rather than continuous stream. Um, and here we really have packets of data, so we created our own. Uh, I, I should say that GNU Radio, uh, GNU Radio developers yes. would yeah, argue with that. Yes. Well, uh, they are arguing that they're working on it, but it's uh, not there. They, they, they say that it works already. Well, okay. I mean the next branch, but yeah. Uh, at least at the time, I really wasn't convinced by it, and so uh, and so I wrote this, which is very similar actually to the signal processing um, that you will find in uh, OpenBTS, for example. And the the API is actually um, heavily inspired from it, uh, except it's written in C and not in C++, and it's not. Um, especially, especially linked to GSM, which uh, the, the code in OpenVTS is pretty much uh, linked to GSM for, for most of it. And then you have also GMR itself, which is separated into two main parts, which is the software defined radio part, which handles you know, all of this. It's currently reception only, however, it should be fairly easy to, uh, to try uh, transmission because modulating a signal is actually much easier than demodulating a signal. Uh, especially for such simple modulations as uh, uh, the production phase shift scheme that's, that's used uh, here. And then finally, you have the old layer 1 and old layer 1 will implement uh, you know, all the primitives that exist, so uh, convolutional coding and things like that. There is no, it's pretty simple in GMR, you know, it's pretty basic techniques, it doesn't use things like turbo coding or, or, or things like that. One thing that it does use, though, is uh, what's called tail biting uh, conversion coding, which is a special way to apply for water correction um, and not waste any bandwidth. Which is and 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 yeah. Well, um, I don't know how we can explain this. Um, essentially, it's pretty annoying to demodulate, and uh, it's pretty uh, CPU intensive. Uh, and also some kind of error prone, but uh, it's only used for the voice channels uh, TCH3, which carry the actual voice frames. But anyway, for now, the voice frames, we have no idea to feed them through a decoder or anything. Like um, yeah, that, uh, I'll hopefully show that in the demo. This is the main reception tool. Um, the version that you'll find in, ma in the master branch only supports um, reading from C file. And it really needs to be a C file because uh, you can't use a FIFO actually because uh, C file is memory mapped. So that's more than FIFOs. Uh, so it, it's kind of, kind of for offline processing. However, since then I've written a live decoding software. And what you do is you just start the multi rx tool and you ask him to feed the data not to file but to FIFOs and then you can use 
this tool uh, in the live branch, uh, giving the address of all the FIFO and say to which RF can they correspond, and then it will try each, find all possible carriers, and possibly follow uh, the various immediate assignments, that is, uh, channel assignments uh, from one RF can to one another, things like that, and forward everything to to one shop, and then hopefully if we can get a signal, we'll be able to to try this. Uh, yeah, wire shock. So we can't decode those data, as I said, with the lights. So all we can do right now is look at the protocol traces. And to display those, we use one shot because it's really useful to for, for whatever thing to JSON tap. Um, we didn't write all part, I mean, the specifications are very big, you know. Uh, so we didn't implement everything yet. Um, and if it's sad, so all the year two is done, so you get actually reconstructed the layer three messages to, to analyze. BDCA, which is the, the, the beacon channel, is only partially decoded. We decode some of the most interesting information, uh, like the center of the spot beam, uh, that is, uh, for each possible um, channel you receive, you get the GPS coordinates of where that beam is centered. Um, that's, that's one of the most interesting messages. CCH, which is just another kind of uh, broadcast channel. We don't dissect everything that the spec says we can find on there, but we dissect all the message we've ever seen on Turaya. Yeah. So if at some point you do a capture on Turaya and you see a message that's not dissected, um, you know, keep the, the capture, send it to us, and we'll have support for it. Same thing for radio resource. We decode a bunch of stuff. Everything we've seen, we've decoded it, but we don't decode, you know, the few uh, like 50 or 60 messages that are potentially possible in the specification because we actually don't think they are used on Turaya at all. Uh, some of those messages seem to be useless for the other specification. Uh, call management and mobility management, well, they're completely common with GSM, so we're not going to rewrite the decoder, we just format it to the GSM decoder. Uh, the only kind of bug with it is that. Everything in the command text for those messages is going to say GSM instead of GMR, but you know, we can live with that. Um, so, yeah, I'll try to. So, this, what's left to do? Uh, find the cipher when I have to kind of check. Uh, find the speech algorithm. Well, yeah, that's still to be done. TDMA framework, that's the experimental life branch. Um, so we're working on it. Then we're going to try to implement the, the upper layers. Uh, since a lot of. I mean, the layer one is pretty much implemented completely for, for most of the, the things. Layer two is sufficiently close to LAPDM that we can reuse 99% of our code. We just need to change a little bit the. Um, encoding routines and layer layer three. We just need a new resource uh, radio resource management. But as I said, the concepts are pretty much the same. Only the encoding of the message changes. So we could actually get to a point where we reuse most of Osmocom DB, which implements kind of GSM phone, and uh, apply it to GMR. Uh, it should be kind of a neat trick. Um, for that, obviously, we need to transmit something uh, first. Uh, CSN1, okay, this is the reason uh, BCCH is not completely dissected in Wireshark is that instead of specifying all the message in like byte aligned field like they did for GSM, which is pretty easy to write a uh, dissector for, they use the formal specification language called CSN1, which if you know ASN1, which is an uh, abstract uh, syntax notation. Uh, this is concrete uh, syntax notation. Um, what it does is it, it describes, like in, a, in some kind of language, how the messages are formatted. Uh, unfortunately, we don't have any um, code generator for that. But we think for CSN one, like uh, yes, yes, he has one. I mean, we don't have a free one. I mean, yeah, the, the Harold uh, could use one, and the, the for for GPRS we created one, so we could. Probably reuse that. Yeah, but for GPRS, <laughs> you you used it, uh, and you had the Wireshark files. Okay. Yes. The thing is, we don't have the Wireshark files. We're trying not to write them. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, but I think it's pretty straightforward to convert from CSM to the. Um, oh yeah, it's straightforward. It's just boring. 
<laughs> oh yeah, there, there is nothing, there is absolutely nothing hard in it. You know? and, and, and compared to GPRS, it's really easy because it's all very simple stuff. It's just boring as shit. Yeah. It's reading pages and pages of, uh, of specification and entering macros, uh, you know. I think it would automate this pretty easily. Sorry? So I think it would automate this pretty easily. Pretty yeah, easy. that's, that's the point. But the problem is we actually need to be able to parse their, their language in a kind of a syntax tree or something. And um, that's something um, we've been trying to do. The problem is CSN1 yeah, is so, so crappy that it's not easy to write a parser. Probably a good task for a student. Yeah, sure. <laughs> Why do you have slave labor? <laughs> <laughs> Funny, I don't have uh, one of those, but uh, uh, yeah. And so yeah, uh, a big help uh, in this project has been Dimitri, which, which has worked a lot on on, uh, on the reception and a lot the error parts. Uh, the radio part. Yes, yes. The uh, everything basically from the air to uh, a C file has been uh, done by Dimitri. Um, around uh, which uh, initiated the project, uh, uh, which was actually, uh, at first I, I thought it would, it would be kind of boring, but uh, you know, when you get uh, get into it, that we can get uh, interesting uh, pretty pretty fast. And Steve, uh, which, uh, which tested a lot of stuff and, uh, and came up with a bunch of uh, different antenna designs and, uh, and cheap ways to actually receive the signal. He tested the fan cube, he tested the um, GPS um, LNA thing. Um, so yeah, and so yeah. If you want to read the specification, that there. there. <laughs> uh, but you can just read the wiki, and the, the easier is to look at, at protocol trace. Um, is any of you familiar with GSM? Yeah. Of course. But, uh, yeah. If you are, it's pretty, it's pretty easy to, to to read. So well, that's it for uh, GMR. Um, So we, so we could either try yeah. the reception right now, or we could uh, switch to Tetra and do all the reception stuff later. I think it might be easier to just explain Tetra. Yeah, and then do, do the like hands-on stuff later. Yes, yes, I think so. Um, I'm going to take a look at the